from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in the ABC commentary box at Adelaide Oval, venue of the second Ashes Test match between England and Australia. And it has been, well... We'll come to the kind of day it has been in a moment. Adelaide Oval, one of my favourite grounds in the world. And looking out now, the scoreboard is under lights. The crowd have all dispersed. There was another gorgeous sunset with a purpley pink sky. It's going to get even hotter as this week goes on. But Adelaide, what a wonderful place to stay to test cricket. And sitting alongside Ali, Jim Maxwell here with this wonderful view of the ground that Ali's been talking about uh, a famous cricket ground in all its glory with over 30,000 people watching today. And uh, it was a very tough, grinding, attritional day of test cricket. But uh, the conditions here in Adelaide are set to be pretty warm over the next few days. So we'll see how the pink ball wobbles. But you've got to be dressed for the occasion, as you can see. Yeah, and this is Sunil Gupta for All India Radio New Delhi, where it's actually getting colder by the day, but it's getting hotter by the minute in our cricketing world. Ali, I couldn't help noticing your your uh, top with all the flowers in it because we are having our own mini War of the Roses here. The white ball captaincy and the red ball captaincy. I'm sure you've read a bit about all that happening. Rohit Sharma taking over and Virat Kohli with the test captaincy. So a lot of time. Then the vice captaincy, the team selection, Pujara. Rahane, that entire thing. The team's finally taken off for uh, South Africa. And, uh, you know, the IPL, can you leave that behind? So you've got all these shenanigans about the IPL. Who's in the team? Who's been out? Who's poaching who? Um, where is David Warner finally going to end up? <laughs> Lots of stuff going on. Exciting times here in India. i tell you where he ended up today. Back in the pavilion, but only after making 95 out in the 90s for the second time in as many test matches. But... Yep, I've got the flowers on. Jim's got the pink shirt on to match the pink ball test we've got here. And you mentioned Captain Sunil. Well, the start of this test match, I haven't known anything like it. Australia suddenly had a different captain walking out to the toss. And it's none other than Steve Smith, the vice captain, elevated out of nowhere when Pat Cummins was deemed a close COVID contact the night before this match. News only broke around about 10 a.m. local time with the match starting at 2.30 in the afternoon. Jim, it was an extraordinarily busy start to the day news-wise. Everyone was scurrying to try and find out exactly what had happened. And it turned out that Pat Cummins had been out to a restaurant, someone who we knew on, on the next table had flown in, taken the regulation COVID test on arrival into Adelaide, was waiting on that COVID test result, but it turned out to be positive. And that is what scuppered Pat Cummins playing in this match. He's now got to isolate for seven days. And it very nearly scuppered Mitch Stark and Nathan Lyon, who were in the same restaurant, but they were actually outside. So they were more casual contact than close contact. And that could have been uh, r ridiculously upsetting. I mean, it, it struck me that uh, the team had absorbed this news by the time we got around to starting the game in the afternoon. <clears throat> and the fact that there was a bit of a delay uh, allowed a, a reaction that sort of said, OK, this is the news. We've got that. Let's take it on board. And the other good thing that probably happened, given that Michael Nisa was making his debut as a replacement for Cummins was that Australia batted. Had they bowled, it may have been a little more challenging than what occurred on the day. But a, a truly remarkable start to the day. And, uh, well, we continue to get surprises as this pandemic keeps spiking. Indeed. So, now, have you ever known anything like that when a, a captain of all players... I mean, there's been times, sure, where they get last-minute injuries and warm-ups, but to lose the captain so soon to the start of such an important test match? No, I can't really recall. I was thinking about it. Yeah, you're right about, you know, uh, Rohit Sharma, for instance, uh, about to make his test debut against the West Indies, and I think he, he sprained a hamstring or something of that sort, and he couldn't play, and somebody else came in. And that delayed his test uh, debut for quite some time. And that's happened quite a few times. Uh, on the on the morning of the test match, actually, with a couple of people. But I cannot recall a captain dropping out, and not for a reason like this. I can understand, you know, if mm. he was hit on the head with a ball while fielding or something. 
but uh, the closed COVID contact, uh, we haven't seen the, you know, the end of this COVID um, impact, uh, at, least, at least for the next year. Well, there was such debate at the start, or well, before the start of this tour, as to England even coming because of the COVID conditions. Jim, has there been any indication that this might result in COVID conditions tightening for the players? Because they, they are absolutely at the moment allowed to go out for dinner, or admittedly, I think, in, in small groups, so that, you know, should this type of contact happen, you don't wipe out, you know, six or seven players. But England would be very, very unhappy, and I'm sure Australia would as well, if there was any sense of trying to restrict, you know, how much the players go out to try and stop this happening again. You've got a dilemma here. On the one hand, most of the premiers in Australia, not all, uh, want there to be a, a good family environment for Christmas and they're keen to relax the impositions that have been placed on everybody. And goodness knows what the psychological scars of all this are going to be. But then, uh, because this virus is starting to spread, uh, there's a, a acute awareness amongst the politicians and the medicos that they may have to be stricter. So it's a bit of watch this space, and particularly as it's mainly about from here, Victoria, and then New South Wales. And New South Wales tends to be taking a more relaxed attitude towards uh, this pandemic at the moment, but they've got all these cases on the rise, and so too is Victoria. So it, it's a, a world that you cannot predict, as we know from being here in Adelaide 12 months ago. Indeed. Suddenly it meant that Steve Smith walked out, I think, in Pat Cummins' jacket, actually. I saw a photograph, and it was actually the same... 47 number that Pat Cummins wears out uh, when he does the toss. So guessing, yes, yeah, Steve Smith was not expecting to have to put on a green and gold blazer and do the toss. But yeah, we didn't expect to see him in this position. Sure, vice captain, but yeah, he's in that leadership role. Do you think it's actually almost the best way that this could have happened to him, that it was so last minute, you know, no time for opinion pieces about, you know, the rights or wrongs of him being captain again and that sort of thing? Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, first of all, if you just think about you think about irony and you think about, you know, all these things that pop up and where he was, you know, two or three years ago and suddenly vice captain now walking out as captain. You know, even you know, truth is stranger than fiction. I think that's really what happened over there. But I just hope that Pat Cummins wasn't wearing that jacket in the restaurant, because if he was, <laughs> I don't think Steve Smith would have walked out either to, to do that task. But really, if you, you, know, you, you talk about, uh, as I said, irony uh, and poetic justice to a certain extent, I guess. Um, yes, well, at the end of the day, what goes round comes round. And I guess he's paid his uh, dues for what he did. And I think you're absolutely right, Ali. Uh, you know, no time uh, for discussions, no time for, uh, you know, all the stuff that happens behind the scenes. You walk out, you take it. And I think it was a very good reception that he got when he came out to bat as well. Yeah, did you notice that, Jim? The real, it was quite a spine-tingling reception, actually, when he came out, I felt. I was on at the time of Warner's dismissal and... Uh, I was just watching and listening, and yes, it, it was very solid, very supportive. And uh, I, I think from Smith's viewpoint, it, it would have been a, a wonderful a, a relief to have that appreciation given the circumstances of, of all this. So it was a good moment for him and for Australia in the way the crowd responded. Smith came in to bat after a 172-run stand between David Warner and Marnus Labashain. There'll be lots of conjecture again about the makeup of England's bowling attack. They did take an early wicket in Marcus Harris, but they failed to penetrate. There were chances, though. Uh, Labashain offering two chances, both to Joss Butler, one very, very late in the day. The first one uh, was... Uh, yeah, a leaping chance that Butler wasn't able to hang on to, the one at the end of the day, much more straightforward. But in terms of the bowling lineup, Sunil, they've got Broad and Anderson back, but they opted in advance to leave out Mark Wood. Do you think that's the right move? No, absolutely no. I think he was the best bowler on show in Brisbane. <clears throat> and I think that, um, you know, when you go into a test match with only a part-time spinner, you're actually painting yourself into a corner. And that, I think, is exactly what England have done. You saw the, the amount of turn that Joe Root was getting. He got, uh, I think it was Labuschagne himself on the glove, or was it Smith? And it went through uh, backward short leg. So there is spin and bounce. Nathan Lund would be licking his lips. So I think the team composition, I really do think that uh, they missed the trick over there. I, I would have had Mark Wood just for the pace that he generated. Because 
all the other bowlers are in the you know late 120s, early 130s, and that's just about it. So it's you know, too much of a muchness. You need to have a righty in your attack. Two samey, Jim. Two samey. Five right arm fast, sometimes fast medium bowlers. Um, and they got their length wrong for a lot of the day. I mean, Labuschagne played very doggedly and he left the ball well. But on this surface, as we've seen with the drop-ins in Adelaide, if you go on length, unless it's full, you know it's probably going to go over. And there were a couple of LBW moments that ended up with no result for the bowlers. But um, they went for this strange tactic mid-afternoon of trying to bounce Australia out. And it may have... uh, born a result had they taken that catch when Labuschagne was 21. A wicket or two can make all the difference. And if Australia had been three or four and not two, there's every chance that uh, England may have got away with restricting them to under 300. And I'm not so sure that's going to happen now. Well, Australia played their first day-night test match. The first was played in 2015 on this ground, and Australia have won every single test match that they have played under lights in Australia since. That is a formidable record. Next on Stumped, history will be made this month when the USA welcomes Ireland as the first full ICC member to tour the country. It's a huge step for the USA, fresh from being announced as co-hosts for the T20 World Cup of 2024, the men's that is, alongside West Indies. Ireland will play the first of two T20 matches in Florida with three one-day internationals over the coming weeks. It's a significant milestone for Team USA and their new Indian-born captain, Monank Patel, who joins us now. Monank, welcome to Stumped. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. That's the first time that you've hosted one of the full member nations on American soil. So just explain the significance of that to you. Definitely the biggest home series we have ever had uh, before. It's a great opportunity for us to uh, play against the Test Nation uh, side. And yeah, it's a huge for, huge moment for us. Like the series will be broadcasted uh, around the world. And uh, we are really excited to play against the uh, Test Nation side. And the uh, fans are looking forward for this upcoming series too. What were the facilities like when you started the organization, you know, the club cricket and uh, to get the tournament set up? I mean, how did you find that? How did you get around that? Uh, how did you organize that? now that you've got a team that is playing uh, a full ICC member uh, very soon. So we, I, I, start, I joined U.S. Cricket about, back in 2018 when I was eligible to play. And uh, we have a, a, I, I'm from in New Jersey and uh, we have like, uh, I play for the club. So there are different leagues. And uh, now we just had a national championship uh, held, uh, held in, uh, back in November. So the domestic structure is getting better here and a uh, lot of young talents and a uh, lot of uh, players uh, have a chance to showcase their talent. And um, basically, uh, there were like more than 150 players uh, participate in the national championship, uh, including the under-19 players. So the domestic structure is getting very, very strong and there are a lot of chances for the young talent and a lot of local players to uh, showcase the talent and uh, uh, get a ch- pathway and a chance to represent the country. Can you tell us a bit more about how cricket's profile in the United States has changed in the last 10 years? Apparently, you're launching a, a major league of six teams in 2023. Cities-wise, uh, state-wise, they have uh, different clubs, very uh, different leagues. There are different uh, tournaments uh, playing around the year, Almost uh, eight to ten or uh, uh, different opens like LA Open, US Open, different tournament, private tournaments where people all over the country uh, play together in uh, different teams. So overall, it's a very very uh, great opportunity for the uh, players to play together uh, against each other. And yeah, if you see before two years or three years, uh, the cricket was not that much which we are playing right now. Right now, we are playing almost 12 months uh, a year. Yeah, Maranka, what's the reaction been, the general public reaction? I mean, cricket is obviously not so well known, but now that you've made it to this stage and you hope to qualify for the next T20 in Australia, um, what's the reaction been knowing that the US will co-host the T20 World Cup in 2024? That's not very far away. And what infrastructure is there to host uh, this world event? I mean, 
will there be special cricket stadiums or will there be, you know, you use a baseball stadium and you set up a pitch over there and re sort of furbish that? How does it work uh, in, in the US? Uh, right now, there are different grounds already uh, been prepared and uh, in different uh, locations. But I don't know exact the ideas about uh, and the information exactly where it's been, which part of the country it's been uh, going on. But yeah, definitely there are like three or four stadiums uh, uh, in the process. And uh, uh, it has to, it's going to help us as a local players and young players uh, where the cricket will grow basically with this uh, opportunity. So that's a great potential launch pad 2024 World Cup for the 2028 Los Angeles Olympics and getting cricket included there. So uh, just generally, what more needs to be done in the US to develop cricket? Uh, right now, it's a it's a process. It's not going to happen within one or two years. And the process has already been started. Like there are different, uh, almost more than 50 uh, indoor facilities and outdoor facilities are, are already started. And the others are all, other facilities are already in the in the process. So before this, two years or three years, there weren't enough facilities where uh, players can um, go and uh, practice. But now, if you see, there are different facilities in all over the part of the U.S., and which will definitely help the youngsters and different players to practice all over the uh, year. Before, it was like very seasonal uh, months they used to practice, but now they can practice all over the year. So it's in, in two or three years, I see different grounds uh, in almost all part of the country where you can also play cricket outside and, and the games and, and, and it's, you, you're not dependent on just for the indoors practice. We'll look forward to tracking that progress and indeed how you go, the global qualifiers as well. Monak Patel, thank you so much for joining us on Stumped, captain of the USA men's team. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stumped here on All India Radio. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter. We're at BBC WS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumped. And check us out on YouTube as well. Go to BBC World Service YouTube. Uh, thanks to Sunil Gupta and Jim Maxwell. And of course, to you all for listening. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.